Today we're here on the shores of the Severn River on the main stem of the Chesapeake Bay in Crownsville, Maryland to celebrate Earth Day and the completion of the Severn River's longest living shoreline. Today you'll get a preview of a new documentary and learn what a dynamic living shoreline is and how it came about and why it's important to our environment and how it can help our infrastructure with sea level rise. On a normal Earth Day, we would normally have this beach full of volunteers planting grasses, trees, and taking action to help our environment. We are living in unprecedented times, but there's a great story to be told here of homeowners, local and state government, and local environmental community who push the envelope to do the right thing. You will hear from some of our elected officials, shoreline experts, and those who designed and built the project. We want to hear what you think, so if you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, make sure you comment, ask a question, and don't forget to hit like. So what is the story? Humans and water are connected in many ways, so it's not surprising that many are drawn to the water's edge for either recreation, sustenance, or just peace. For more than 50 years, our shorelines have become hardened with stone revetments and wooden bulkheads. On the shores of the scenic Severn River in the Chesapeake Bay, homeowners Janet and Jim Clausen wanted to use their waterfront property to do more for the river they love. The project was actually begun because we had high cliffs which were eroding quickly and large trees were coming down. So we had to do something. Severn River is about midway up the Chesapeake Bay. It's a highly populated area between Baltimore and Annapolis. 75% of the shoreline along this river has been altered or armored, hardened to prevent erosion over the years. On part of our property, we had wooden bulkhead and stone revetment. And we knew that as the water comes down past those armored structures, that it erodes the land downriver of it, which happened to be the spit which was protecting Fox Creek, which is a tidal pond. So it didn't make sense to go to armored structures, and we wanted, therefore, to do the living shoreline. There has been this movement to try to figure out how do we get the shoreline stabilization components that landowners need, and also protect or enhance the public resource. And so that's really what living shorelines are. Is we have a cliff face here with uh, a lot of energy coming across, again, this 13-mile fetch across the water where winds and waves are allowed to build. And it was banging up against the, uh, the bottom of the cliff face. And then as a result, it would undermine that cliff face, and a section of, of the land would then fall down to the base and then erode with those waves out to sea. When people think of environmental restoration, they think of streams, stormwater, and tree plantings, all in order to deal with polluted runoff, to clean up and protect our waterways and improve habitat. But what can you do once the pollution reaches the rivers and the bay? This is called a dynamic living shoreline. Relatively new practice for shoreline stabilization that is set apart from all other methods. It employs the energies and tide water to work for us. In the state of Maryland alone, there are more than 3,500 miles of shoreline. Before humans began to develop along waterways, shorelines were dynamic, always moving and adjusting. If you think about what these kind of areas were like before all these homes were in, and before the, all the bulkheading and shoreline hardening, you had certain areas that were large depositional environments. Organisms were all over the place, grazing, burrowing into the sediment to eat the, the organic material that was trapped there. The 1844 Coastal Geodetic Survey, where they actually truly surveyed the entire Chesapeake Bay. You look at those old maps, and there are plenty of abatements, there's plenty of natural, I call it geomorphologies. So you go look in the 1890s, there's a massive amount of erosion that occurred in those two time periods. What's the reason? We had power boats between those periods. All of the old practices that were bent on armoring against tidewater energies had detrimental effects in almost every case to the vital living resources. So trying to restore some of those natural features that once existed here is really important so that we can provide habitat and help improve water quality. We have observed where we have two other very successful dynamic living shorelines, an incredible habitat happening in the shallow waters. From a purely practical goal of preventing erosion, the project grew to creating habitat. We've seen this challenge on shorelines throughout the world. In a few minutes, you'll learn how this project was designed. But first, we have a message. 
Hello, happy Earth Day. I'm Lieutenant Governor Boyd Rutherford, and I want to thank those who are involved in the Clawson Living Shoreline Project, making sure that the health of, a, of the Severn River is maintained. I want to thank you for all the work that you do every day to improve our natural environment. Thank you again. So now let's hear about the design and permitting challenges and what it took to get into construction. To pull off such an engineering feat, there had to be a solid design, a good plan, and seamless execution in the construction process. This project was engineered using empirical ratios for headland embayments all across the Chesapeake Bay. The idea behind this headland breakwater approach is that it dissipates wave energy. So a, a revetment or a bulkhead is engineered to withstand the forces of nature. They are armoring against it. I've been working with living shorelines for about 35 years now. And over the years, it's evolved. We were pretty conservative in the very beginning doing these types of projects. There's two different philosophical camps when it comes to shoreline protection. One is the defensive camp, which is building seawalls, bulkheads, and that's been practiced over time, most specifically in the United States. It's the conventional approach of, I'm gonna beat that mother nature. I'm just gonna armor that thing so hard that she can't possibly move it. And there's the other philosophical camp, which you actually understand the shoreline processes and working with them. But you need to define what, you're, what type of environment you're working in. And once you understand what is affecting the shoreline, then you can make intelligent choices how to select a design strategy to effectively manage the shoreline. So one of the engineering difficulties with this project, due to the amount of wave energy reaching the shoreline and due to the unique approach that we proposed here, is that we had to go channelward with our fill. Historically, the unwritten standard for encroachment channel words was 35 feet. Over the years, the Army Corps changed their values to allow for a 50-foot encroachment. This one is up to 110 feet. Certain regulatory boundaries that we had to cross to produce a soundly engineered project. And any time you're doing something new, something innovative that's typically run into problems with permitting and regulatory agencies. The Maryland Department of the Environment recognizes that we need to uh, encourage more living shorelines on the river and on the bay itself. Because of the Living Shoreline Act of 2008, they are committed to this. We were very excited to see this one come in. Um, it was an interesting project. The bulkhead removal piece, the stabilization of the eroding shoreline was a big element to it. It was great to see so much landowner contribution uh, to the project. The focus on the design of these projects is on these shallow aquatic beds. And the shape of that embayment is determined by embayment ratio. Which is essentially you have two fixed points and when the waves come in they interact and create an embayment shape. And this is ubiquitous across the world. By building these structures out further, the gap between adjacent headlands can widen, the bays get bigger, and therefore you can protect the same amount of shoreline with less rock. One of the fears was, well, you can't design a project whereby sand is gonna stay in place on the shoreline. It's just gonna wash out to sea. These projects can oftentimes be difficult because you're really at the intersection of federal and state regulatory decision-making that sometimes is at odds with each other. They're not necessarily used to seeing it. For them, they want to give it a little bit closer review, and so they can oftentimes be very complicated, and getting a good project done can then sometimes be harder than getting a bad project done. We started four and a half years ago now, but it took a long time to get through the process to really refine the design in order to have something that was going to be acceptable to the state agencies as well as to the coastal engineers, so that there was great confidence that this was going to work. Most people never see what goes into planning restoration projects. Sometimes it takes patience. Here's some more messages. I'm Jeannie hadaway Riccio, Secretary of the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. DNR is proud to have partnered on this project, which is preventing erosion, providing important habitat, and reducing pollution. 
It's also a great example of the all-hands-on-deck approach that's needed to meet our Chesapeake Bay goals. In honor of the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, I want to thank everyone involved with the project, especially Janet and James, the property owners. So after all the planning and patience from the Clausens, it was time to get building. Let's see how this project came to life. This is my favorite part. With permitting out of the way, it was time to get building, but there were still challenges. The very beginning of the project, we had to access off of a 35-foot vertical cliff. So we really just dove in, used our design plan and our engineering numbers, and created a nice gentle slope from top of bank down to receiving waterway, which was tide water. It was fascinating to watch it grow. You know, we knew what the plan was from the standpoint of building the haul road and then using that and building up the beaches and the, um, the different elements as you go. And it was wonderful to watch. Most Living Shoreline projects are the majority of fill. So for this project, we brought in uh, large amounts of sand, gravel, and cobble at the beginning to build our ramp and our access way and then shape that material up into the permanent features as we left. The most trucks that we had on any given day was 37 trucks. We brought in roughly uh, 120 to 130 loads of material and that symphony, that carousel of equipment and personnel and people all moving made that possible. We, we accessed from land, we did not need to use a, use a barge, so it really minimized the disturbance of SAV beds and underwater habitat. For the whole job, I mean, it was over eight, 900 trucks. We anticipate every truck that we uh, bring onto our site to get stuck. So we always, you know, have one person in the front, one person in the back, safely backing the truck down. And we back it up as far as we can so that it's dumped into its design positioning, knowing that we may have to tug it out a little bit on our way out. As the trucks rolled in, the neighbors took notice. In a community like this, you know, you see a car go by maybe every 90 seconds. For 110 dump trucks carrying 70,000 pounds to roll through every 90 seconds, um, it's a change in people's lives. They want to know what's going on. So we have to field and answer all those questions in a polite but efficient fashion at the same time. One of the unique aspects of this project is the headland structures are constructed of a mixed aggregate. Typically, if you look across the bay, you see one size stone uh, that does not have anything living on it or breathing on it. We mix boulders bigger than your vehicle. And cobble and gravel and sand. There was even an opportunity to use dredge material from a nearby town. And it's a mixed layered aggregate so that we can create a 10 to 1 very gentle slope to allow accretion on the headland structures themselves and ultimately provide for habitat and long-term resiliency. Then very carefully sculpted so that it would uh, respond to what the river wanted. We basically take the engineering and the physical components of our permit, but then add a level of art to the project, which is required because nature you know, isn't an engineered box. So you have to find a balance between the permit, the engineering parameters, and ultimately the last step, which is the fine tuning and the art. Through the unpredictable weather of late December and January, the project grew quickly. Before you knew it, dump trucks could drive all the way to the end of the beach, and the last tumbolo was being constructed. Watching the construction was fascinating, wasn't it? I'm sure it was a lot harder than it looked but it grew quickly and it started functioning immediately. Now time for another message. Hi everyone, I'm Ben Grumble, Secretary of the Environment for the State of Maryland. Happy Earth Day and congratulations to Janet and Jim Clausen. What a tremendous achievement to have such an impressive living shoreline for the State of Maryland and for the Severn River and for the Anne Arundel County folks, everyone who's been involved in this project. Congratulations to the Severn River Keeper to the private sector, everyone who pitches in and to help make an important improvement and protection of our living shorelines. You know, we have over 11,000 miles of shoreline in Maryland, and it's important to remember that it's not just bulkheads and seawalls, it's living shorelines, it's the shrubs, it's the bushes, it's the softer path to provide clean water and healthy habitat and to reduce the storm surge and the, the risks of flooding. So I want to congratulate everyone involved in this important work. I want to remind you that the state of Maryland is absolutely committed to more and more living shorelines. And one last thing, 
Have a great Earth Day, celebrate, and recommit to a greener, softer path. So with the construction done, what has the project taught us so far? After almost five years of planning, permitting, and construction, the dynamic living shoreline on Kyle Point was completed. This has been an incredible feat for the homeowner, for the designer, and for the regulators. Even having seen the plans for many, many months, that once the, the project actually was coming out of the ground, it was really even that much more extraordinary. The scope and the size and the just overall presence of the shoreline restoration was just simply bigger and, and better than I was ever expecting. Like any leap forward with innovation, there are other successes to learn from. After years in the ground, the pines on the Severn and the Windy Hill living shorelines have thrived and proven that this method works in three different types of waterways. We did a similar project, and, and it was part of the Assateague Island State Park, that utilized some similar techniques that they're using here at the Clawson Project. And one of the somewhat surprising, but very fortunate things that happened there is oyster spat, and how oyster spat sat and set on the headland structures that were created out there. I am thrilled with it. I just couldn't be more happy with it. Immediately, visibly, environmentally, we've had lots of wildlife suddenly show up down here, but again, in how much enthusiasm the community has for this. And I've seen so far uh, science and just general naturalist observation. This is a really effective way to turn the health of this river around and to make it the, an even more valuable resource than it is now. Our goal was to get rid of a, a wooden bulkhead that was a desert environmentally. Working with the state, we developed a plan to remove the wooden bulkhead and establishing a living shoreline, which literally lengthened the shoreline because rather than a straight line, we had curves and loops and we had uh, grasses that uh, went all the way down to the, to the water. At the beginning of the project, we made arrangements to work with the Virginia Institute of Marine Science to document the before and after effects of this project. So before we started, they measured the benthic organisms, those in the, in the muck at the bottom, and they measured the fish populations and shellfish. Uh, only polychaete worms existed uh, on that site prior to its construction. And then for four years after the project, they came back and sampled, very objectively documented greater diversity of species in greater numbers. There were seven species of clams. Uh, there were fish species, rockfish, even redfish found there. We, we really see the habitat as being both for the marine life for the shorebirds because the ducks moved in within weeks of having the, the breakwaters cr created and also for the woodland creatures who need access to the water. And I think that the addition of all of the native trees and shrubs and grasses is going to be essential. And it is something that the University of Maryland has been pushing. It's having something on this scope and at this magnitude where we're using all natives I think is all going to be very positive. So this project has the benefit of creating a whole lot of habitat. You would never get that out of a stone wall or a bulkhead. Now let's hear another message. Happy 50th anniversary of Earth Day. It's a very different kind of an Earth Day this year. We've all been asked to stay home and isolate ourselves from one another. And I don't know about you, but I feel as though one thing that's constant one thing that we have to keep us from feeling lonely in this time is the natural world that surrounds us. I hope that as we come out of this coronavirus isolation that we'll remember that it was nature that comforted us and that we will do everything we can as individuals, as county government, at every level of government, as a community, to pass on the land and the water that we have to the next generation in better condition than we found it. We have a lot of hard work to do to get there. Janet and Jim Clawson are showing us the way with um, a great example. So happy Earth Day. Let's get back to work. Let's follow the example of the Clawsons. Hi, this is County Executive Barry Glassman coming to you from the beautiful Deer Creek Valley in Hartford County. I'm proud to have contributed to the City of Havre de Grace's project to combat coastal flooding. 
and put $500,000 towards a living shoreline project in their beautiful city. Take a chance to enjoy all that Mother Nature has to offer on this Earth Day. So the project's been built, habitat's been restored, but there's another great benefit. Check it out. These projects ultimately do more than just help the environment. With sea level rise upon us, with larger and stronger storms, building for resiliency can save property and lives. Some Maryland municipalities are using the same approach to protect their infrastructure. Well, one of the things that we're, we really concentrate on at Haverty Grace is, you know, not just solving the problems for today, but looking down the road to the future, because that's where you really save your money in the long run and enhance the water quality of the area. Resiliency is going to be found in softening the shoreline and working with the wave energies. This pout is across the state, across the country, where they're dealing, they're the front line for this resiliency and preparing for climate change. We know what's coming uh, and we need to be listening to our scientists and doing what we can to address that effort. For me personally, resiliency is the ability to accommodate sea level rise. It has a dual prong. One is to protect what we own. The other is to protect what ecological services these shorelines provide. Like almost a perfect correlation between sea level rise and coastal erosion, which makes sense. As sea level goes up, the shoreline erodes. And that's something we just have to face and be aware of. And one of the things that we've focused on in the last five plus years is trying to build in this resiliency lens into all of these projects. And we want to do that by building robust natural systems that are dynamic, but also stable. Yeah, Annapolis is a waterfront town. We're surrounded by five bodies of water. And so our survival um, lives are really, everything revolves around that water. And so with sea level rise and any kind of flooding downtown, be it from hurricanes or climate change, uh, we, we're gonna be significantly impacted. The Dutch, they've reclaimed what was submerged sea before. They've learned over time that these are the systems that you need to have in place to actually accommodate sea level rise. The city of Havre de Grace, Maryland has already begun their living shoreline retrofits, right where the Susquehanna River meets the Chesapeake Bay at their city's promenade. This is one area of focus, but you know, Havre de Grace has a long shoreline. From the Yacht Basin, uh, where the promenade is, all the way up to the North Park Trail, where the Havre de Grace Lockhouse is, can be very similar in projects of this scope, size, and scale. Yeah, we have a group who is looking to put in a living shoreline on uh, St. Mary's property, right on Spa Creek. It's going to be a beautiful project if we can get that through. What really makes us innovative is just an amazing network of staff here at City Hall and Havre de Grace, and actually a lot of the local citizens, uh, and help from museums like the Maritime Museum. The current mindset in permitting tidewater projects is based on a mean low and high water. On the Severn River, for instance, it's only a one foot difference. You know, now that we're recognizing sea level rise, the notion of designing these systems with this really strong focus on low tide line and the high tide line is probably an approach that needs to be reconsidered. What, what stresses the shoreline out is elevated water and a wave coming in. Maryland Department of Natural Resources has been a great partner. They're the ones that have allowed us to experiment within the framework that we can operate in. During these storm events and high tide events, they're not only gonna withstand these forces, but they're actually gonna build on these forces. We hear a lot about sea level rise and the term resiliency. As you can see, this project is suited to deal with the future. Time for more messages. Hi, I'm Amanda Poskaitis from the National Wildlife Federation. Happy Earth Day. I'm here at the St. Luke's Project, enjoying the great outdoors. NWF is a nationwide federation with 52 state and territory affiliates and 6 million supporters. Through habitat protection, restoration, and management, our far-reaching impact has brought many species back from the brink of extinction, including whales and American eagles. The National Wildlife Federation recently partnered with the Coastal States Organization to develop a report entitled Softening Our Shorelines. This report is designed to promote the broader use of living shorelines. You can access the Softening Our Shorelines report at www.nwf.org backslash softening our shoreline. Let's hear another message. Uh, hello, I'm Mayor Buckley. We would like to wish everybody a happy Earth Day 2020 from the city of Annapolis. The city of Annapolis knows what climate change looks like. 
We know what it's gonna be like if our streets flooded and we don't address global warming. And you have probably dealt with it coming downtown and experiencing the flooding that we have to combat. Last year was the highest amount of flooding, sunny day flooding days we have ever seen. So we are addressing that. We're addressing a lot of climate issues in this city with our amazing non-profit partners and the hard work of the Waterways Cabinet, without whom none of this amazing work would be happening. Thanks to them, currently, we have 20 projects on the books. It is essential that we take care of our wetlands, our streams and our rivers and our shoreline restorations to make this water of Annapolis pristine and leave it for the next generation. We have to save this planet and what better day to think about that than Earth Day. This dynamic living shoreline uses the regenerative process to sustain and function. The process is also used in stormwater management and stream restoration. Let's see what this means and how we can replicate this project. In early April, a series of strong wind events showed how the project fared as the sea level rose and fell five feet within two days. When the water receded, the sand had moved slightly within the embayments, but more sand had washed in from the outside to find the curve of the shoreline. It's been stress test. The water went above the pier. The, the embayments have been shaped in. It's pure physics. It's called self-design principles. If you set things in the correct position in that time period and you set a trajectory forward, and you make sure it trends in the right direction, similar to like raising kids. This is the future. The beautiful thing is it changes with time. It will trap more wood, and, and that's what we would call regenerative or self-sustaining. It's going to react differently to a big nor'easter versus a summer low. I take a long view of things. Shorelines are meant to move back and forth. If it doesn't bend, it breaks. All of those structural approaches are as good as they're going to be the day they go on the ground. With this particular approach, this regenerative approach, we call it, it's as weak as it's going to be as we finish construction. Every day thereafter, it's getting stronger. The grasses are growing, the sand settling into the appropriate position for dynamic equilibrium. Waves being allowed to run up on a shallow beach, drop their sediment load and drop their energies before slowly trickling back out. The point of living shorelines is not just that you're creating low marsh or high marsh or some arbitrary combination of the two, but preserving the range of habitats that occur in a healthy intertidal system. What the success of these projects show are that living shorelines need to be designed around the larger storm events with extreme high and low tides if you want them to be resilient over time. We need to encourage and uh, work with the Maryland Department of the Environment to permit many more of projects like this. There are hundreds of miles of shoreline in Anne Arundel County and there are thousands of miles in the state of Maryland and we would really like for waterfront communities and individual property owners to think about alternatives to bulkheads and revetments. And by neighbors joining together, you can create these living shorelines without the same amount of material. It's just wonderful. You know, the site looks great. I think the landowners are happy with the outcome. We're certainly happy with the outcome. My understanding is that MDE is excited. So it really is a win-win for us. The project itself is wonderful, as well as the outcome for the county, which is a very cost-effective set of nutrient and sediment reductions on the Severn River. That kind of pollution reduction for runoff from the suburban areas in the Severn watershed will help to remove the Severn's summertime dead zone. This particular project is just a good one to represent what can be done by individuals and by communities to improve the environment for all of us. Anne Arundel County is absolutely behind living shorelines uh, and trying to make it as easy as possible for landowners, whether it be private homeowners or community associations, to make living shorelines a reality. In addition to the environmental benefits, this project has influenced policy and has shifted the parameters permitting shore erosion control projects. Again, I'll give credit to the Clausens for, for really just having the fortitude to stick with this over the years. But I think it's going to pay off in big ways, not only for them, not only for the critters and the water quality, but also for other people who want to undertake similar types of projects because somebody has to kind of crack that door and keep it ajar so that other projects can get done as well and they really did that. The Anne Arundel County environmental community was enthusiastic from the beginning. Underwood of course but also the Maryland Department of the Environment 
and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources, because without their support, this project would never have happened. And the Severn Riverkeeper was a pivotal part of getting this project accomplished, and we really would like to thank them all. We have a long way to go to get many more projects of this caliber onto the river. The family loves the project. They enjoy bringing their pets and uh, being able to walk the shoreline as well because they grew up here. So this is their opportunity to see what it can be. It provides waterfront walking access down a pathway to a shoreline. We are looking forward to being here for the rest of our lives and watching the shoreline develop. Give it another month, you won't even notice that we were ever there. We're always available uh, for consultation, for providing some technical assistance. And if you've got any questions, please don't hesitate to contact our office, aarivers.org. I would recommend this to anyone. Regardless of the scale, there is something that can be done. You rock, Ms. Clausen, Mr. Clausen. Thank you. The completion of this project shows that with the leadership of our elected officials, the commitment of our environmental community, and the willingness to innovate and execute by our regulators, engineers, and contractors, big things can happen. Most importantly, it was the patience and the desire of the Clausens to do the right thing for our river. Hopefully you can learn how to replicate this on your shoreline or your communities. Stay tuned for a full-length documentary, Dynamic Shores, to be released later. And don't forget to like the video and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Happy Earth Day, everyone. <laughs>